Good morning, everyone. Happy Mid Lent to you. Let's um, let's say a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we move into the final chapters of this uh, book of Romans, I ask you to to renew our interest and even more than that, renew your spiritual leadership here so that we can plunge into it wisely, receive it with open hearts, and to uh, apply it to our lives and to our, our worldview of where we are in salvation history and how we should proceed and what we should do to, be, to facilitate your work and your will. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. In Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let me rewind a few frames to bring you up to speed. We ended up in about the middle of chapter 9 last time. Chapter 1 through 7, of course, Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul is putting forth the good news as he understands it. That the Messiah has come, that everyone needs him, and that he is for all. He is the promise of universal Salvation, that is, salvation available to, to everyone. In, in chapter 8, we had that glorious conclusion of all that he said in those first seven chapters. Um, let me just touch on a few of those. In verse 14, right in the middle of chapter 8, he says, in kind of summary, and, and, and in just a, you, can, you can feel his joy, all who are guided by the Spirit of God are sons of God, which is how he has explained we are justified, we are saved. We become children of God. For what you received was not a spirit of slavery to bring you back into fear. You received the spirit of adoption, enabling us to cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins with our spirit to bear witness that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, provided that we share his suffering so as to share his glory. And Paul considers the suffering that comes with this life is part of the good news. Because number one, it's unavoidable anyway, but in Christ it can at least be meaningful. All right? Tremendously meaningful. Not just wasted, evil pain. And on top of that, the suffering we undergo for Christ or offer up to God for whatever good purposes he can use our sacrifices. It's also redemptive and meritorious. So I told you in his cost-benefit analysis, he's concluded, no matter what I have to suffer in this life, to live faithfully, which to Paul is the definition of faith, living faithfully, I consider it all a meager price to pay for what I know is going to be my return, my reward. Okay? So that too is part of his good news. And he goes on for the rest of that chapter talking about then for, for us, glory is our destiny. We are called to share in His glory and that it's guaranteed by the love of God and that nothing can separate His love for us from us. The only thing we have to worry about is our own sin, sin our own a a apathy, our own hardening of our hearts, all right, of turning away of such a wonderful um, gift. All right? But in the grace of God, he says, everything that happens for those called to his purpose, even the, the tough stuff, even the hard things, can be turned to good. All right? Now you would think, and he ends chapter 8, by, we have come through all these things triumphantly victorious by the power of him who loved us. All right? So he's, he's on a high note. But immediately in chapter 9, he says, but this glory... This victory that makes me so happy, this wonderful good news that is so spectacular, also makes me incredibly sad. And that's what he's immediately going to go into in chapter 9. He's actually in anguish. He says, because he's a good Jew. And he is understanding that the Jews, by and large, are rejecting the gospel. All right? And he's saying, now I'm not anti-Jewish and this whole, the next three chapters are all about his response to that. Don't, I'm not anti-Jewish. I want you to know I would give my own soul up 
if the rest of my kinsmen would get it. But Paul's come to understand, and he's going to explain in these chapters, how he sees his current day and that generation as paralleled and foretold in the Old Testament. All right, And he knows what's going on. He thinks his call is to be the, be the, gospel, be the um, apostle to the Gentiles, but also to try everything he can to save a remnant out of Israel. And he'll use those terms. He understands, by and large, the Jews have missed something very important. And they're not accepting the gospel. But he's going to, give, he's going to talk to them for a while, and then he's going to turn around chapter 11 and talk to us. All right? About what it all means. So we, we, we started it last week. He said, there's great sorrow and unremitting agony in my heart. Not because of the great invitation that's been given to the Gentiles, but because as a good Jew, he realizes they're, for the biggest part, rejecting the message, okay? I could pray I myself might be accursed and cut off from Christ if this could benefit the brothers who are my own flesh and blood. So there, there it is. Now what is he saying is their big mistake? He, he kind of goes on, he begins it in the next few lines, which we also talked about last week. They are Israelites. It was they who were adopted as children. The glory was theirs and the covenants. To them were given the law and the worship of God and the promises. To them belonged the fathers. And out of them, so far as physical descent is concerned, came Christ, who is above all, God, blessed forever. So he gives this list of their promises and prerogatives. But he says the greatest attribute of the Jewish race was that God preordained Christ would come from them. All right? So what he's, what he's saying is that we Jews misunderstood. We thought God chose us because we were better than everyone else. We were holier than everyone else. We were wiser than everyone else. All right? Paul is saying, no. We were, were treated specially by God because He preordained, He chose us out of His grace and mercy to be the race out of which would come the Christ for the world. All right? And that in our arrogance, instead of that humbling us and realizing it's God's free gift of grace and mercy, this wonderful privilege, we thought it's all us and that this Jesus Christ who doesn't fit our understanding of what the Messiah would be, you've rejected. So instead of being the first to line up and say, Hallelujah, the Messiah is here, they're the last. And this is Paul's agony. This is the hardness of our hearts. All right? All right. That brings us about to where we were. To the middle of chapter 9. Verse 25. And let me tell you, the rest of chapter 9, all of chapter 10, and the first few lines of chapter 11 are laborious. Or they can be. You know, Paul is very prone to use typology. We've gone through this before, right? Where he will give a line from the Old Testament. And what he expects is, for if his audience knows the Old Testament like the back of their hand, that they will realize where that line came from. And the context and the story that it's lifted out of will add volumes of meaning without him really going into it further, right? He's just giving us a, a quick a link, a computer language, right? A link that if we pressed on that highlighted blue phrase, it brings us to a whole world of new websites, right? Well, that's what Paul's doing in the minds of his readers. And it's also an invitation to us, if we don't know those Old Testament scriptures, to, to stop, put down what we're doing, go back and find it, and understand that context, okay? But it, he does it, he deploys, it's genius, you know. It's a, it's a masterful literary skill that he has there. But it's so thick right here that if we did even a tenth of the ones he's going to uh, put out, We'll be here for days, all right? So we just can't do it. Um, it it's beyond the scope of, of our study right now. And, and it mostly is dealing with 
the Jews, and he's trying to make the point that all this that we're dealing with now has been foretold. It's not a new prophecy. It's been foretold by the prophets you respect. All right, and he's going to go through this uh, next 40 or 50 verses in this these, uh, chapter and a half or so. And just one after another, he's going to quote Old Testament prophets and verses. <sighs> Hosea, Joel, Jeremiah, the Psalms, but especially, especially the second half of Isaiah and the last few chapters of Deuteronomy. So we need to at least consider why. The, the last few chapters of Deuteronomy includes a, a prophet prophecy. It's called the Song of Moses. All right, if you've and this is Moses just before he dies. He's he's led the Israelites for forty years in the desert. He tells them, you know, we got here in the first two weeks you know, because you rejected the heart. You didn't believe. I, we got here. God said, take the land. I sent the ten young men in to spy. They came back and eight of them said. We can't do it. Their cities are fortified. They're giants compared to us. They're well armed. They're, we can't do it. Two of them, Joshua. And, and can you give me another interpretation of the name Joshua, by the way? Yes. Yeshua can be interpreted Joshua or Jesus. All right. So Joshua and Caleb said, but wait, that's all true. But God's on our side. We can do this. You saw what he did to the Egyptians. You know, they're all swallowed up in the Red Sea. You saw how we've defeated nations to get here. You've seen how he's provided for us. We can do this. But the people listened to the eight instead of the two and told Moses, we won't, we're, not going, we're not going over there. So God sent them back out into the desert for 40 years so that entire adult generation, except for Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, died off. Now their children have grown up. And their grandchildren are now there. And they've returned, and now they are going to march across and take it. But, but God has told Moses he's not going to cross the river. He's not going to be the one to lead him in. It's going to be Yeshua who's going to be the new leader. Hmm. There's just so many temptings here. All right. So it's Joshua is going to take them into the promised land of what they were saved for. All right. And Moses gives this prophecy long into the future saying, you're going to go over there and you're going to take the promised land. You're never going to fulfill the commands of God fully. You're, the future generations are going to be just as rebellious as the previous ones. And eventually, and God will punish you for it, the ultimate punishment is going to be to disperse you to the nations. Then God will rescue you. God will, and he will but first what he's going to do is actually convert these persecutors, the Gentile nations. And in doing that, he's going to use a line, make you jealous that your God is blessing these enemies so much and it's going to cause you to want to return to God too. And then I'm going to bring you all back in. All right, Paul, and I told you, he's already referenced himself to, to the Israelites and to the Moses situation a couple times last week. Do you remember that? Well, he's really doing it a lot here now. Because he sees his situation just like that. By the way, the 40 years. He, the 40 years in the desert. Paul sees himself right in the middle of the 40 years. Of the new exile, you might say. In 30 AD, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. And he said it would happen within this generation, which is 40 years. All right, And we know in 70 A.D., exactly 40 years later, the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem to the ground, destroyed the temple, trampled on it, made it illegal for Jews to even live there anymore. That was, in essence, the end of Judaism as it had always been practiced for a thousand years up to then, including to today. With no temple, there's no priesthood, there's no sacrifices, you know, all those things that God told them to do, they can't do without that temple. All right, and the temple's not rebuilt now, even, even though they've retaken Jerusalem. All right, so Paul knows that the clock is clicking. They're in the middle of 40 years between when Jesus said that 
and however he's going to fulfill it. And he's trying to make the remnant as large as he can. He's doing his best so that w when we get there, as many as possible will cross over with me and with these Gentiles. Because the, 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 your wrong ideas and your religion as you know it is coming to a, a terrible judgment. Okay? That's why he's quoting that. All right, let me just pull a few lines out. Uh, verse 25, which is where we left off. He says, just as he says in the book of Hosea, I shall tell those who were not my people, you are my people. And I shall take pity on those on whom I had no pity. Now, this is not Paul saying this. He's quoting Hosea, the prophet, okay? And in the very place where they were told, you are not my people, they will be told that they are children of the living God. He's saying that's being fulfilled now, okay? He will say, oh, let me just jump on a little bit. I'm going to mention this for a reason. Verse 32, because they were trying to find it in actions and not in faith. He's talking about how the Jews went astray, the old Israel did. Why? Because they were trying to find it in actions and not in faith. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone. All right, he's quoting Isaiah there. And he's going to say, Now I am laying on Zion a stumbling stone, a rock to trip people up. But he who relies on this will not be brought to disgrace. He's saying that's being fulfilled. Jesus himself said, I am the cornerstone, which will be the building block for some and the stumbling stone for others. Okay? Then he goes on in chapter 10, Brothers, my dearest wish and my prayer to God is for them. He's talking about the Jews. Again, my anguish is for my kinsmen, that they may be saved. I readily testify to their fervor for God, but it is misguided. Not recognizing God's saving justice, they have tried to establish their own instead of submitting to the saving justice of God. But the law has found its fulfillment in Christ, so that all who have faith will be justified. He's saying Christ is the purpose, the fulfillment of the law that they love so much. They're missing the whole point. It was given to them. He's saying it is Christ. That in Christ they perfectly fulfilled all the law has been commanding of them and, and leading them to for all these centuries. He goes on and says, Moses writes of this saving justice that comes from the law. And he says, I'm in verse 5 now, whoever complies with it will find life in it. But the saving justice of faith says this, do not think in your heart who will go up to heaven. He's just putting one Leviticus, Deuteronomy, he's one after another. And I know this isn't really making sense to us without going back, but we just can't. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will go down to the depths? That is to bring Christ back from the dead. What does it say then? The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. Can I just tell you, I know that doesn't make that much sense, but if we, if we spent the time and went back and unpacked all those references, there's three or four or five of them right there, it would. <clears throat> His conclusion in verse 10, It is by believing with the heart that you are justified, not by following the law, and by the declaration with your lips that you will be saved, not by kosher foods. When scripture says no one who relies on this will be brought to disgrace, it makes no distinction He's between Jew and Greek. He's, right? No one, it says. The same Lord is the Lord of all and His generosity is offered to all who appeal to Him. For, now he quotes Joel, for all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Another prophet, Joel. First two chapters of Joel, especially in chapter 3 as well. For in the latter days, my spirit will be poured out on all flesh, Joel says. Does that sound, well, who else employed that verse? Do you remember? At Pentecost. Peter. Peter, when people said, what's going on here? We're, we're, we're seeing this building rocked and everyone's speaking these strange language. He's saying, what was prophesied by Joel is being fulfilled right now. The day of the Lord is come. All right? When my spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Okay, he's quoting Joel. His purpose, as I said, is for them to, not, to understand it's been there all along. We've been using the scriptures to fulfill what we wanted our, our understanding to be of them and we've been ignoring key passages that are folded throughout. 
Then he goes on in another place that doesn't make, doesn't seem that smooth, but it would if we unpacked it. He says, verse 14, How then are they to call on him if they have not come to believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard of him? And how will they hear of him unless there is a preacher for them? And how will there be preachers if they are not sent? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messenger of the good news. My spirit is being poured out on all flesh. But how are they going to know the good news unless someone takes it to them? All right. So he's, he's understanding that preachers are being sent out. To all of the nations so that they understand the day of the Lord has come and what it means. And he says, I am one of them. Right? So the Jews are accusing him of being a turncoat, of being something very nasty and, and ugly. But he's saying, no, I'm a preacher of the good news. And just as it said in Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news. I'm one of those that God is calling beautiful, even if you hate me and think I'm a despicable thing to consider. All right, that's the context there. He took that from Isaiah as he does the next line. But in fact, they have not all responded to the good news, as Isaiah says. Lord, who has given credence to what they have heard from us. But it is in that way faith comes from hearing. And that means hearing the word of Christ. <sighs> He's anticipating that they're going to say, okay, well then we can't be blamed because we've not heard that message until now. And he goes on the next few verses to say, yes, you have. It's been in the scriptures, and these, as I have explained earlier, it's, it's even seen in all of creation. All right? Uh, that's where he's going to quote Psalm 19 there. That is a, a psalm that extols the beauty of the law. But it says the law, even before it was written on parchment, has been written in the heavens, has been written in creation. All those who just have eyes and are open to the good Lord will, can see him revealed in what he's made, and in the life that we live. It's the same argument he made that the Gentiles have no excuse in the first chapter or two, you remember? Now he's saying, you Jews too, you sing that in your own psalms. So yes, you have heard it. It's explicitly in the scriptures, and it's, and it's all around you in creation. So you don't have the excuse that you've not been told. Then he quotes Moses here, Deuteronomy 32, that, like I told you, in verse 19. In the first place, Moses said, I rouse you to jealousy with a non-people. I shall exasperate you with a stupid nation. <laughs> Isaiah is even bold enough to say, I have let myself be found by those who do, did not seek me. I have let myself be seen by those who did not consult me. And then referring to Israel, he says, All day long I have been stretching out my hands to a disobedient and rebellious people. This is Isaiah 65, Deuteronomy 32, over and over and over and over again. And each of those, you could write a doctoral dissertation on Paul's use of typology in chapter 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, okay? You could, I could, but it's, it's, it's there, all right? Because each, each line here is a, is, is a, a massive uh, insight. Questions about any of that? So I just summed up five hours of work. <laughs> but I hope you understand the gist of what he was trying to tell them. And since he was speaking primarily to the, to the Jews, I didn't want to spend a lot of time there because in the next chapter he's got a lot to say to us. Hmm. Alright, any questions about any of that? Or comments? I have a comment. Just, let's go back to verse 9. Um, Isaiah 62, verse 9. Isaiah 62, verse 9. Make us aware that in the environment that we're in today, there are those who believe that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved, that that's it. And that's the ultimate um, activation that you need to make. And some of them even go as far as to justify saying baptism isn't even necessary because if you're confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart, that that's all it's about. Well, if that's the only scripture we had, that's fine. But Paul's already spent, it's like I always say, to quote the middle of chapter 9 as if chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and the first half of chapter 9 didn't exist is not a very complete theology. And we've been through it over and over and over again that he, that he says, expounds on that much more than that. So what he means by that is 
pretty clear if you study the rest of Romans. But yes, if you take it out of context, you can create a very simple formula for saved and satisfied. And he's not done criticizing what I call greasy grace or the saved and satisfied or got it made in the shade because I profess with my mouth and believe, I can say in my heart, but believe at some level that Christ is Lord. Uh, he's going to have more to say about that. And it's very hard. Okay. But it is important to do that. No, it is. I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying if you take that as the whole formula at its most shallow level and think then, then the implications of what I just did don't exist, then you didn't even really do it. Okay, that was what Paul would say. I mean, okay. Because it says believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. Not just agree intellectually with an idea that doesn't really impact your life. If you believe it in the heart, that's a transforming conviction. All right? which causes us to live faithfully. And as I say before, that's Paul's definition of faith. It's not agreeing to an idea. We need two different words. But we have one word and we, we banter it around for two extremely different meanings. Right. Missy? Um, where, where St. Paul talks to the Jewish people about you, you just cling to the law, that makes me think now why they were so um, offended when Jesus said, don't think I came to abolish the law, I came to complete it. Isn't this what Paul's expounding on? Yes, because Paul is saying, you know, you're clinging to the law, but for the wrong reason. Okay. You should treasure the law because it is the, the, the road map, the, 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 the light post that leads you to Christ. But instead, you're taking the law to justify your preeminence. It's made you prideful. You think if, because if you're descended by, from Abraham and you practice the law to some extent, even though he points out none, not even the Pharisees do it perfectly, but because of that, you're good to go. And it's because you're, and you, can, you, you have the right to look down on everyone else. Paul's saying, you're, the gift that you've been given, you, you now look at it as something you deserved and it's made you arrogant. It's made you hard-hearted. And God, just as He did to Pharaoh, has allowed your heart. It, the time is coming where what you want will be given to you. There's a door closing. There's a chapter beginning and one ending in salvation history. And Paul is saying, please, before we get there, where God gives you the hardened heart that you're persisting in, come with us. That's what he said. He's saying he's pleading. He said, I'd give my life. I'd even give my soul if you would get this. He, I mean, he loves them. He said, I love the law. I love the tradition. I love the fathers. But I love it because it's God's gift to us and I know why he gave it to us. And it wasn't because we're so much better than everyone else. It's a free gift we didn't deserve. Out of us, of all these gifts and prerogatives, the greatest one came at the end. And it was... In the fullness of time, the greatest promise for which all the others were even gifted and given for was that out of us would come the Messiah who's for the world. And therefore, we would be the firstborn of many brothers, he says, right? Not the only one in the house. All right? A universal blessing. But we were meant to be at the front of the pack, the top of the heap. Instead, we're the last to show up. And it's breaking his heart. Jesus even speaks to us today in, our, in, in the gospel. John reveals to us in the Samaritan woman where she said she's representing the Samaritans who were separated. The outcast, the really, right. I mean, the whole history, without going into the history of how they separated and everything. But we know that they all had relation together. They were all of one people at one time. Their descendants go the same way. They were descendants of Abraham, too. Descendants of Abraham, and yet they deviated during the Babylonian exile, I guess. And so anyway, the point is that uh, Jesus is saying to her, the woman, because she said, our people worshipped on this mountain. And Jesus says, there will be a day when no one will worship either on this mountain or in the temple in Jerusalem. Right. And he's revealing to her or to the people because remember the village is out later on. 
revealing to her that all are going to be worshiping him or worshiping the Father, and he is the Messiah right. that's bringing them. Because she said, I believe that, that there was going to be a Messiah or understand, and he says, That is me. Well, Jesus, faithful to God's plan, preached primarily, brought it first to the Jews. All right? But even in doing that, we saw the Samaritan woman. We see Gentiles converted and all this kind of stuff. And later on, the P Peter and the rest of the apostles will remember that because when they're trying to get this thing. And Peter himself will have the experience of a very uh, 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 aha moment where he preached reluctantly to Cornelius and, and he got saved. He said, I knew he got saved because the same thing happened to him that happened to us at Pentecost. So I baptized him. And I got out of there as quick as I could. I did, right? I went because God made me go. I, you know, I preached the Jesus thing. They all got it. Pentecost came up to them. So I baptized him. I left. He didn't know what to do with that for, for years until finally Paul's trying to say, this is for everyone. And Peter's going, yes, of course. That's what he's he been saying all along. But let's don't forget, as we move into chapter 11, the first converts, the original church in those first few years were all Jews. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus' mother is a Jew. All the apostles were Jews. The 70 disciples were Jews. The first deacons were Jews. The first thousands of, je of converts there at Pentecost were Jews. All right? Let's don't forget that. It's true, as time went on, the vast majority of the church were Gentile converts. And the Jews became a very small minority. But the foundation was Jews. And Paul wants to now speak to us a little bit. In 11, he's going to go on a little bit more with the, what he's been saying, talking about the remnant of Israel. Because we might now say, is it possible that God abandoned his people? Out of the question, he says, I too am an Israelite, descended from Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God never abandoned his own people, to whom ages ago he had given recognition. He goes on and he quotes some lines from 1 Kings here, as well as Jeremiah, and then Isaiah again. And then he, goes, he says in verse 5, In the same way then, in our own time, there is a remnant set aside by grace. And since it is by grace, it cannot now be by good actions, or grace would not be a grace at all. He, he does a little bit more quoting from Deuteronomy and Psalms. Uh, well, I just need it. God has infused them with a spirit of lethargy, Verse 8, until today they have not seen, they, not have, they have not eyes to see or ears to hear. David too says, may their own table prove a trap for them, a pitfall and a snare. Let that be their retribution. May their eyes grow so dim that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. But now Paul says, but Christians, let me tell you something. Lest this begins to make you feel smug and arrogant. That God has now rejected them and accepted you. The same thing is going to happen to you. He's saying the same thing is going to happen to the church. From here, verse 11 of chapter 11 to the end of the chapter, he's going to say what he understands from a deep revelation that he's been given. That there's going to be a season where the hearts of, the, of Israel are hardened. Very few converts. And Gentile, the church will be made of Gentile converts. But when the number of Gentiles that God has preordained, if you want a predestination, here's where you can put it. Paul's going to say, there is a set number. All right? And when that, well, maybe it's gazillions, but when that number is fulfilled, the age of the Gentiles will be closed and, and the Jews will, be, will start being converted in great numbers again and that this will be a sign of the end times. A great falling away of the church, a great coldness of, in the church. Uh, where, where, where Christians are going to say, we're tired of the gospel, it doesn't work in our day and time anymore, we're going to reinvent it to something that we like better, we're going to quit working hard at it, we're going to, you know... And so here again, saved and satisfied is not going to get it. He's going to say, your hearts are going to grow cold, you're going to be presumptuous, just like the Jews are presumptuous on the law, you're going to be presumptuous that because you were baptized or because you professed with your mouth, you are saved. You're not maintaining a fervor for the Lord. You're missing it. You're missing the point of what you were saved for. And that a sign, the end of the age, will be a great falling away of authentic 
Christianity. And you don't have to look very far. And he also says, and then, and that in that same time, the Jews will be restored in great number. It's a mystery, he says. Now, you read some of the uh, ancient church fathers. They used to write about this a lot and try to figure out what it all meant. Uh, not so much anymore, but, but it's here. Let me just read some of it, okay? And I'll just pray that it'll speak to you more powerfully than I can. Verse 11. What I'm saying is this. Was this stumbling to lead to their final downfall? Again, he says, out of the question. On the contrary, their failure has brought salvation for the Gentiles in order to stir them to envy. Remember, we've already been through this before. And if their fall has proved a great gain to the world and their loss has proved a great gain to the Gentiles, how much greater a gain will come when all is restored to them? Let me say then to you Gentiles that as far as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in this work of service. And I want it to be the means of rousing to envy the people who are my own blood relations. He's got ulterior motives. <laughs> He's called by God, but he says, one of the reasons I'm happy to do it is I'm hoping when my own kinsmen see goodness of God poured out on you, that it'll make some of them want it. Okay? Just go back to Moses. Saying, saying Moses. Yeah. Moses is saying that right. And Moses was predicting it. That's what Paul is saying. We're living what Moses predicted. This is the time. He and Joel and Isaiah and, and, and Micah and all the rest, we're all predicting, okay? We're living it now. That age has come. Since their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world, do you know what their acceptance, re-acceptance will mean? Nothing less than life from the dead. Now, ooh, ancient church fathers used to write a lot on what that meant. By and large, they concluded it meant the resurrection. Okay? That's why I said, if you read the catechism today, our own catechism, it doesn't expound a lot on this. It, it, it leaves it cryptic and, and, and mysterious, as Paul does here. But it says, a sign of the end times is a great falling away of Christians and a great conversion amongst the Jews. It doesn't say much more than that, except it quotes Romans 11. There you go. Verse 16. When the first fruits are made holy, so is the whole batch. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. He's going to explain here that we Christians, we Gentiles, are like wild olive branches that have been grafted on to the root. But the root was Israel. Okay? And he's going to say, how stupid it is. Don't ever be anti-Semitic. That's like the branch trying to poison the root. And we get our life from that root. To kill the root is death to the branch, okay? Pope John Paul II says we are all spiritual Semites, Jews, okay? But he's also going to say if God could graft the wild vine onto the root, how much easier can he graft the natural vine back on? He's going to say that himself. Now suppose that some branches were broken off and you are wild olive grafted among the rest to share with the others the rich sap of the olive tree. Then it is not for you to consider yourself superior to the other branches. And if you start feeling proud, think. It is not you that sustain the root, but the root that sustains you. But you will say, branches were broken off on purpose for me to be grafted in. True. They, through their unbelief, were broken off, and you are established through your faith. So it is not pride that you should have. But fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, He might not spare you either. Remember God's severity as well as His goodness. Saved and satisfied? Sleeping in easy street Christian? Remember God's severity as well as His goodness. His severity to those who fell. His goodness to you as long as you persevere in it. That's what He says. If not, you too will be cut off. And if they who do not persevere in their unbelief, and they, if they do not persevere in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For it is within the power of God to graft them back again. After all, if you cut off from what was by nature a wild olive, could then be grafted unnaturally onto a cultivated olive, how much easier will it be for them, 
the branches that naturally belong there to be grafted onto the olive tree, which is their own. Did he not just say exactly what I just said? I want you to be quite certain, brothers, of this mystery. To save you from congratulating yourselves on your own good sense. Part of Israel had its mind hardened, but only until the Gentiles have wholly come in. Okay? And this is how all Israel will be saved. As Scripture says, from Zion will come the Redeemer. He will remove godlessness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take their sins away. So as regards the gospel, they are enemies, but for your sake. But as regards those who are God's choice, they are still well loved for the sake of their ancestors. There is no change in mind on God's part about the gifts He has made or His choice. Just as you were in the past disobedient to God, but now you have been shown mercy through their, own, through their disobedience. Excuse me. You have been shown mercy through their disobedience, so in the same way they are disobedient now, so that through the mercy shown to you, they too will receive mercy. God has imprisoned all human beings in their own disobedience, only to show mercy to them all. And then he concludes this mysterious chapter with this little hymn. How rich and deep are the wisdom and the knowledge of God. We cannot reach to the root of his decisions or his ways. He quotes Psalms and Isaiah here. Who has ever known the mind of the Lord? Who has ever been his advisor? Who has given anything to him so that his presence come only as a debt returned? Nothing there is comes from him and is caused by him. Excuse me. Everything there is comes from him and is caused by him and exists for him. To him be glory forever. Amen. Chapter 12 through 16, he's going on to an exhortation to, to Christians. And la the last chapter is really his greeting specifically to people he's met in other places who live in Rome. Remember, he's not been there yet. So it's a little different vein. So I don't want to go further than this today. We've got two more weeks and we'll end on Palm Sunday. Okay, we'll accomplish these last four chapters. But I want this to sink in because we don't talk about this and except in chapters uh, uh, 11, it's not very explicit in the New Testament, but this mysterious prophecy of Paul about the reconversion of the Jews is pretty impactful, isn't it? It's sort of, but it's profound. But also, I think it's sobering to us because he's telling us, we too, no better than they, we Christians also will, be, will grow apathetic, will be tired of the same old gospel, We'll take the grace of God, the prerogatives given to us for granted, and there will be a coldness and a falling away because we will stop persevering to what we were saved for. Presumptuous. Is that that I've done a few perfunctory things, and therefore I'm good to go. Here, probably more than anywhere else that he's set it up to now, Paul is cautioning against spiritual presumption. That you've done something and therefore you're okay no matter what else you do. There's no need to do anything else. Living faithfully has nothing to do with having faith. Paul says it's the only way to have true faith. Um, just, just to tie in, Luke also says the same thing about what Jesus says. So, How, about Jesus says? About the Gentiles. About yeah, the, oh yeah. The, so, the Gentiles. Yeah. so really, Paul is... Quoting Jesus as well. Yes, he's quoting, he's quoting Jesus, and of course Luke got it from Paul. Because well, uh, Luke... Paul trained Luke, and Luke, who was a Gentile, really liked that part of the gospel, right? Yeah, that's where it ties it in. I mean, right. Luke, Luke goes into detail about Jesus saying that. Right. Luke doesn't write too much to the Jews because he was a Gentile, and he wanted the Gentiles to understand a new day has come. The fulfillment of Jewish prophecy is that we're the age of the church, the age of the Gentile, that the, the promised kingdom of David is a worldwide, not an institution, but a spiritual kingdom. It is the church and is for everyone, just as they predicted. So good news. We're no longer cut off. We're no longer aliens. We are welcomed in fully by the grace of God and His mercy. If you go back and count how many times the word mercy is in chapter 11. It's, it's, you know, I told you chapter 8 is about the Holy Spirit. 
Chapter 11 is about mercy. And you can contemplate on that, how that folds into everything that he's been saying. We were saved by mercy, but God's mercy is not extinguished. His mercy is still, there's still plenty. And it will be extended also to the Jews in a mysterious way when his plan is fulfilled. Thomas Aquinas said that Satan wages his war against people because he knows there's a certain number to be fulfilled of saints. And the more people he can cause to fall and not become saints, the longer he can put off his own final judgment. Now, it's not it's hard to find exactly that way in Scripture, but Thomas Aquinas theorized that. It makes sense, you know, if you look at it a little bit here. Otherwise, you say, what, is, what does the devil have against us? Well, you know, he hates God, and he, and he knows himself at the end of it all, the final judgment, how he's going to end up. So the best he can do is put that off as long as possible. How? By making sure that quota is filled just as slowly as possible. Okay? Something else to think about. Don't tell anybody you heard it from me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but Thomas Aquinas, as a philosopher, yeah. has that license. To yeah, he was a theologian and a philosopher, and he had license to theorize. He was also the angelic doctor. He wrote lots and lots about angels, and, and um, so this is part of that, you know. Lucifer, a fallen angel. So, yeah, it's interesting to read. You don't have to accept it. Or, uh... All right. Comments and questions here. Moving on, the last five minutes. I thought after Jesus came, this is, I'm sorry, but this is news to me. I thought after Jesus came, all the prophecies had been fulfilled. This is going to happen? Or There's prophecy happen? still to be fulfilled, yes. Jesus, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Paul says, there's a mystery I want you to know. And he's saying, I don't talk about it a lot. And the main reason I'm telling you is because I don't want you to be tempted to grow cold either. If God did it to them, he'll do it to you. Yes, Jesus died for you, but Jesus died for them. Amen. Nothing can separate the love of God from you. But you can drift far away from the love of God and bring the judgment on you, which, as I said, is to give you what you want. And to grow cold, to grow hard, at the end he finally says, okay, that's what you've got. Seems like it's happening. Yeah, you don't have to really look very far to say, I mean, you know, I was going to say Europe is basically a post-Christian era, but I think you could say... It's the United States. Okay, thank you. You said it out loud right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, too, too, too comfortable. And, you know, I'm not going to just blame it on... Saved and satisfied. I mean, that, is, that I think is a dangerous doctrine. But I know plenty of Catholics that said, you know, look, I, I go to Mass most Sundays. I've been confirmed. I shook the hand of a bishop one time. I touched a relic of St. Faustina. I wear a scapular, etc. Uh, I got a crucifix in my home. All good things. But they are not living faithfully. They are not the kind of faith that saves, okay? Larry? Just to understand, even the elements of the church, we, we, as holy as we are as a church and the blessing of uh, the mercy of God that was upon us, there were still dark times in our history that we even persecuted the Jews. And, uh, yes. yes. And that's something we have to uh, repent for and, and have. Uh, it is. I think it's very appropriate to read a little bit from 1 Corinthians right now. All right? Which Paul also wrote. Because you're you might be thinking, how do I know I'm in line? How do I know I'm doing this, right? Chapter 13. Set your mind on the higher gifts. And now I'm going to put before you the best way of all. Though I command languages both human and angelic, by speaking tongues, if I speak without love, I am no more than a gong booming or a cymbal clashing. Although I have the power of prophecy to penetrate all mysteries and knowledge, 
And though I have all the faith necessary to move mountains, and I am without love, I am nothing. Though I should give away to the poor all that I possess, and even give up my body to be burned, if I am without love, it will do me no good, whatever. Whew. Do I need to read that again? <laughs> Verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I used to talk like a child and see things as a child does and think like a child. But now I, that I have become an adult, I have finished with all childish ways. And the adult way of living, he just prescribed to us. Mother Teresa says, We're not called to do great things. We're called to do small things with great love. So to stand before God and says, Didn't you see that mountain I moved? Didn't you see that wonderful series I taught on Romans that time? <laughs> didn't, you, don't, didn't you see how I went? I, I got slain in the Spirit and, and had, had gift of tongues. I gave, I gave a prophecy one time that was true. I interpreted tongues authentically. Is anywhere in here Paul who, who said, I did all that more than any of you. He says, but I'm telling you, that can all be worth nothing. Great things. But they're not the motor that drives it. They are just decorations on the car. There's no motor in it. There's no life in it if, it, if you're not motivated by agape love. Contemplate on this as I speak to myself too so that we can be saints. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, your word is true. Therefore, it is life. Bring it to us and also, Lord, Bring us the grace to receive it entirely, not parts of it, but entirely, that it can bring us to true and everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.